Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar on the Service Members Civil Relief Act. I'm here today with attorney Nick Cohenmeyer, who's our speaker. Nick is a great friend and supporter of the library and has become a frequent speaker for which we're very grateful. He's here today with you on this topic. Before we get started, I have just a little bit of housekeeping that I wanted to take care of on behalf of the library. We are offering an hour of general CLE credit for this presentation today, and you will get a certificate by email this afternoon once we've verified attendance in Zoom. So be looking for that in your email. Another thing I wanted to let you know is that you're going to see a link for a survey at the end of the program, and we would very much appreciate if any of you could take a few minutes to take the survey. There's really not very many questions, but it's very helpful for us to get feedback about our programs when we're planning new programs. And then finally, I did want to let you know there will be opportunity to ask questions today. I believe we're going to be holding them till the end because Nick has a lot of material to cover. But if you want to ask a question, please feel free to do so using the Q&A function. You will see that on your screen. It looks like two speech bubbles and the icon that says Q&A. So um, that's where we would like for you to post any questions that you have. Um, you can do that anonymously or by your, uh, your name, whichever you're more comfortable with. So I think that's all I have. I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to Nick. Good morning. My name is Nick Cohenmeyer, and today I will be presenting an overview of the background and many of the essential protections provided via the Service Members Civil Relief Act. You're going to hear the term SCRA throughout this presentation. Again, it stands for Service Members Civil Relief Act, if this is the first time you've heard of it. So the relevance of this presentation is that even if you aren't in the military and don't have any family members who are, eventually you may have a client, a tenant, debtor, defendant who is, and you should understand what their federally mandated rights are and what your responsibilities are to them. Because the penalties for getting it wrong under the SCRA could carry a fine, could carry a jail sentence, could carry both. So the relevance of this topic to me is that I served 16 years in the United States Navy. I'm currently a chief petty officer in the Navy Reserve and a civilian attorney specializing in landlord tenant law in Northern and Southern California. I wrote this presentation with the hope that it will be helpful to my clients, colleagues, shipmates, and any military or civilian audience members today. So some of the essential protections provided under the SCRA that I'll be discussing today concern the following. Civil actions. So probably most importantly are the SCRA's postponements from legal actions such as a default or uncontested judgment, collection, or eviction that might be filed against a service member while in active service. Telecom. This lets you terminate your tel this lets you terminate your telecom contracts, telephone, cable, internet, et cetera, if you relocate for at least 90 days to a location that doesn't have coverage under your current provider. Now the SCRA allows you to keep your current phone number even if you cancel your service, if due to a relocation that lasts less than three years. Lease termination, this is a very popular one. And this is where there's a lot of misunderstandings. I've helped two sailors just this year who got it wrong and had a major falling out with their landlord, which could have been averted if they had known what their rights as well as their obligations were under the SCRA when it pertains to lease termination. I'll get into that in a few slides. Spousal benefits. This lets a surviving spouse terminate a lease if their partner dies on active duty. It also lets a military spouse claim their home of record, the service member's state of legal residence, or the state they're living in for tax purposes. Interest caps. This is another popular one. This limits the interest on all loans taken out before taking on active service to 6%, which for credit cards was always great. For mortgages, became great only recently as the average mortgage rate for a 30 year fixed is now above 7%. So this also includes auto loans, mortgages, student loans, credit cards, and a few others. And then it's risk-free. If you use any of your SCRA rights and do something like a you know delay a payment or allow uh, you know the other side to work with you to basically give you preferential treatment that another civilian debtor might not get, you don't have to worry that it will prejudice you. These are risk-free rights. So don't be afraid to utilize them. 
if you're eligible. Obviously, if you're not, don't try to because then you could run afoul of some penalties yourself. So I will talk about how to verify that A, somebody is in the military and B, that they are currently in qualifying active service because there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of websites that will charge you for something that you can find for free from the DMDC website. And the SRA also gives you other rights regarding property taxes, federal taxes, life insurance, financial and legal penalties or judicial or administrative proceedings and protections from those. Not that they're indefinite, it's usually just a stay or a postponement of what will inevitably have to be dealt with, but you don't have to deal with it while you are actively deployed. And I'll talk about why that is critical, especially for military personnel. So the main sections of the SCRA are on the screen. I don't need to go through all of them, but if you are curious, you're going to look at 50 US code and these are the sections under the Title 50, Chapter 50. Now they used to be enumerated under a different format. You'll see in the bottom right here that it used to be under 50 US code, uh, you know, subsection 501, et cetera. That is changed as of about 2015, they changed how the sections were titled. So you might be looking at information on the internet, which still references the old, you know, section 501, they should all be four digit sections now. And the main part of it begins around 3911. So you're going to look at the US code. I'll have individual citations to the specific code section as I'm citing them throughout the presentation. But if you learn nothing else and you wanna find more information on this, you're going to wanna to go to 50 US code and then start with section 3901. So. Let's get into the importance of the SCRA in case it's not immediately obvious. So why was and is the SCRA necessary for service members currently engaged in or training for military operations? Well, think about the last time you may have had to prepare for a trial or another critical event requiring all of your time and mental resources and how distracting it was when people unrelated to your objective were calling and texting you, interrupting your focus, expecting an immediate callback. Now think how much worse it could have been if they were demanding to speak with you in the middle of, let's say your closing arguments or calling you at 2 a.m. while you were standing watch in a foreign country or demanding to speak with you while you were being shot at. I think you can now start to understand how our military often have special considerations which necessitate special accommodations during their periods of active duty service. This is why the two primary purposes of the SCRA as codified under 50 US Code Section 3902 are one, to provide for, strengthen, and expedite the national defense through protection to service members of the United States, to enable such persons to devote their entire energy to the defense needs of the nation, and two, to provide for the temporary suspension of judicial and administrative proceedings and transactions that may adversely affect the civil rights of service members during their military service. So quick background of the SCRA. The SCRA has basically been in effect, except for a few brief pauses in between some of the earlier wars for over a century, since the 19th century. So during the Civil War, which was the deadliest war in American history, Congress passed a total moratorium on civil actions brought against soldiers and sailors. Now, civil actions generally include contracts, bankruptcy, foreclosure, evictions, and divorce proceedings. So two of the underlying reasons for Congress passage of the total moratorium on civil actions during the Civil War were one, because their union service members needed to focus on winning the war, and two, their union fighters were not getting paid. So their pre-service debts were piling up, which were imposing a hardship on the service members themselves, as well as their dependents back at home. Then during World War I, Congress titled and passed the Soldiers and Sailors Civil Relief Act of 1918. And that was known as the SSCRA for a while. You still will see references to that in old publications. Just know that that was an earlier version of what is now the SCRA. And that resumed legal actions against service members. So back during the Civil War, you had a total moratorium. And that has no longer been the case since World War II. It directed trial courts to apply principles of equity to adjudicate the cases in the absence of the service member. And that statute under the SSCRA expired in 1918. Now during World War II, Congress 
basically reenacted, rebranded, and modified the former 1918 Act as the Soldiers and Sailors Civil Relief Act of 1940. So the main change this time, even though it kept basically the same name, SSCRA, was that Congress removed the sunset clause of the act. And that's important because now the SCRA has been able to remain in perpetuity to protect active duty service members until the conclusion of their eligible act of service or until Congress decides to terminate or significantly amend the act. Since 1940, the SCRA has been amended over a dozen times and continues to remain in place for eligible service members and their families. And yes, service members, families, and their dependents are basically two different categories. You'll see that the way that the law looks at dependents under the SCRA is more of a financial support lens rather than do they just have direct familial relationships. So authority and enforcement. So who is in charge of enforcing the SCRA? Well, the courts the administrative agencies, but especially the Department of Justice. And does anybody know who this individual is? You should. So he, that's Merrick Garland. And under the Congress authority, which is under Article 1, Section 8, which gives Congress powers to raise and support armies, uh, that is what enables Congress to create the sweeping protections under the SCRA. And Congress has provided the Attorney General, Mr. Merrick Garland, with enforcement authority under the SCRA. So specifically, this authority has been delegated to the Civil Rights Division and has authorized lawsuits in federal district courts against those who engage in a pattern or practice of violations or violations that raise issues of significant public importance. And if you think this isn't something that happens a lot because you maybe haven't heard about it and read about it in the newspaper, it there is a wealth of case law on this. And not just at the national level, but state courts as well. Now, you don't want to learn the law as a defendant. Okay, That is kind of the motto of my law firm. The reason you might be here, even if you have no direct attachment to the military, is that you don't want to find out what your obligations are as a creditor, as a landlord, as a plaintiff, before you make a mistake. You, I mean, you want to find them out before you make the mistake. You want to find them out before you get to court. You don't want to find them out when you get to the judge and you learn the hard way. Or worse yet, you violated the statute and now you're facing a fine. So to give you some example of what kind of fines have been imposed, since 2011, the Justice Department has obtained over $480 million in monetary relief distributed amongst 147,000 service members. And the SCRA has been litigated on issues involving lease termination, foreclosures, vehicle repossessions, interest rate benefits, default judgments, and several others. So the armed forces and uniformed services are the two categories of individuals that fall under the jurisdiction of the SCRA. Now, it doesn't mean that they are automatically going to receive benefits. There's a few levels of applicability. First, is the person who is raising the SCRA claim in the military. And once that threshold has been passed, okay, are they on qualifying active duty service? Okay, if they are, then have they raised their rights under the SCRA? None of these are automatic, none of these are implied, and none of these are the burden necessarily of the service member to inform, let's say, the landlord. The landlord needs to know if their tenant or if they run a storage facility, if the person who is renting that storage unit who hasn't returned to the facility in six months and hasn't paid, if they are part of the military. Now in California, it's not a non-judicial eviction state. You have to go through an unlawful detainer to get an eviction, there's no self-help, but in other states, that's different. So even though you already are protected as a tenant from your landlord, you know, locking you out without a court order, throwing your things out. Uh, it just increases the penalties even more. But more importantly, it gives you basically those same protections no matter where you are stationed. So a couple of the specifics as to what armed forces include, the difference between armed forces and uniform forces, uniform services. Uh, armed forces includes the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, as you probably assume, as well as the Space Force and Coast Guard. And then the term uniform services, which you may not be familiar with, includes all of the armed services, as well as the commission corps of the National 
Ocean NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the Commission Corps of the Public Health Service, PHS. So individuals on active duty, which I'll explain next, and attending a service school are covered under the SCRA, but individuals attending training prior to entering active duty are generally not covered by the SCRA. So a few important but nuanced terms that are common in the SCRA are active duty, active service, and active status. So the term active duty means full-time duty in active military service of the United States. That's typically you know, the active duty sailors. If you have family, you, you know if they're active duty. They're reporting to base, they're on a ship, they're gone for a while. That's pretty clear cut active duty. So active duty gets a little more muddled when you're talking about training, when you're talking about reservists, when you're talking about national guardsmen. But I want you to start with you know, the low hanging fruit, the big rocks before we get to the granular sand and the nuances, which can be confusing. So active duty includes all full-time training duty, annual training duty and attendance while in the active military service at most authorized service schools. But the term active duty does not apply to full-time National Guard duty. For full-time National Guard duty, you would use the catch-all term active service and National Guard, there's a difference between whether they're acting under the governor or acting under the president. So generally when they are under the governor's control, they're generally not covered by the SRA, but if they've been activated, uh, such as, you know, there's a difference between like Title 10, Title 30, or Title 32. Uh, that is a nuance that I'm not going to get into right now because it's not important for this presentation. If you are in the National Guard, then that's something you can follow up on with your region legal services office. Uh, it's also more of a Navy Marine Corps town. So I'm going to cater more to the latter audience. Now, Active status refers to the status of a member of a reserve component who is not in the inactive Army National Guard or inactive Air National Guard or on an inactive status list. And if you want to further refine these terms, look for the technical legal definition in Title 10 of the US Code. But that's about all the time I should spend on this category. So when does eligibility begin and end? Well, service members are eligible for the SCRA on the date that active duty orders are received. And in limited situations, a service member's dependents will also be eligible. And again, dependents is not just you know, direct bloodlines, your children, your spouse. It's also someone that I'll talk about in a moment that you have provided over half of their living expenses for over half of the previous year. So most SCRA protections generally terminate one year after the date of discharge of active duty. And there are so many dates that you need to track with SCRA that I think you'll find it helpful at the end of this presentation. I hope you'll stick around to the end. It's only an hour long and less than that at this point, 40 minutes to go. There's a table that I put together that I think will help you. It shows at certain intervals, 30 days, 60 days, 90 days from active service, which rights expire. So you always know that you're within essentially like a statute of limitations. You have to use it or lose it. And it just can get so confusing when you're reading through the US code and trying to sort out what you need to do within 90 days of discharge versus 180 days versus 365 days. It can be a mess. So stick around to the end and I think you will have a better understanding. Active duty who are absent from duty as a result of being wounded or being granted leave are also granted protection under the SCRA. So when you should determine military status of your defendants. Well, if you've ever had to sue someone, especially if you are seeking to collect a judgment, then now you understand why you're usually asked questions about a potential defendant's potential military status. Now, why is this important? It seems like a formality. It seems maybe annoying when you're having to say, this person's not in the military. I mean, look, they're like 70 years old. There's no way they're in the military. Well, the reason you need to do that is you have to do your due diligence when there's certain types of civil actions being brought. Now, why would that be necessary? Why would that be the case? I guess these are kind of rhetorical questions since you have to answer via the chat and there's no time for that right now. But if you want to posit your answer, that's totally fine. Basically, the reason why we need to know if the defendant, if the debtor, if the tenant is in the military is that they are going to be generally precluded 
from defending themselves against, say, a default judgment in court. Not only because they're so focused on the military training, they could be on a ship in the Persian Gulf. How are they going to appear in San Diego Superior Court? How are they even going to find out that they've been served if they're away from internet access? You know, they have Nipper on on some of the commands, which is you know their unsecured military internet. There's also Sipper, which is secure. There's ways to get messages, but that's going to be low priority compared to military traffic across those channels. So the point is, in case it's not obvious, the military members generally, not always, but often have a unique requirement. They have unique limitations that don't befall typical civilians. You may be on vacation and not able to be reached, but you're probably going to be back and you're probably going to be near cell service. So that's why in overarching view, the SCRA exists because military members have unique restrictions on their freedom of movement, their freedom of communication, and their ability to tend to legal matters that can seriously jeopardize their future, their credit, even their custody, if there weren't protections like this. And also, who would want to join the military if they knew how much more they'd be sacrificing in addition to the obvious sacrifices of their life, their free time, their freedom of speech. Now they're going to potentially face potential life-altering judgments against them that they have no ability to defend against. That's why these protections are needed. And that's why you as a landlord, as a creditor, are expected to do due diligence to make sure that the person that you're suing, the person that you're seeking a judgment against is not constrained by their military service. And if nothing else, I hope you understand that we all benefit when we have people who volunteer in the military. It's a volunteer service. And if we don't have volunteers, then we have no choice but to bring back the draft. And do you want your son, your daughter, your spouse to have to serve? Or is it better that the people who want to serve get to so the rest of us don't have to? So think about the shared sacrifice because these are collective benefits that we all get from the military risking their life to give us the quality of life that we've grown so used to that we often take it for granted. So how to verify eligibility. So if you're a landlord, a creditor, a plaintiff, even a judge, you need to know the military status of let's say a tenant, a debtor, or just the litigant. It's not an excuse that you did not know they were in the military or that they never told you they were in the military. The burden is on you generally to determine that they're not. But fortunately there's an easy and pretty much instant way to verify the military status of basically any active American service member to help you reasonably determine whether that individual is eligible for SCRA protections, which will shape how the next steps for you need to go in your civil proceeding. So to do this, you'll want to go to the URL that you see on the screen here. And the difference from this versus the one that you're probably going to find when you do a Google search of SCRA military lookup, that's a private site. And they do a tremendous amount of advertising and AdWords. And they're usually right at the top of Google. And it's very easy to get it confused because they use all the very official looking logos. It looks like it's a military site, but check the domain. If it's a .com, it's not a government site. So this is why you want to use something that ends in a .mil, which is this site. It'll allow you to provide a status report, which you see a snapshot of. I ran it on myself. It shows in the next slide, I'll show you a blow up view of it, what their active duty date was that they started, when it's supposed to end. And these are critical for determining what your next steps are. So the DMDC, which is the Defense Manpower Data Center, is the Department of Defense's agency that collects and maintains the manpower databases for the Department of Defense. So the reason you'll want to avoid you know, these for-profit sites is not only is it a waste of your money, but there's also a risk that you could be compromising the service member's PII, the personal, personally identifiable information, which is not just a problem for the service member, but a problem for you if you were negligent and you mishandled their PII. So there's all kinds of risks of using the private sites, even though they'll tell you it's easier to use ours. We provide you the affidavit. Yes, it's probably easier. You may not need the social security number, but there's other ways you can look up someone's military status. And if you're a landlord, you should learn from a few cycles of what information you need to be collecting when you're starting the tenancy. But you have to be careful. This is kind of a 
tricky between rock and a hard place situation you can find yourself because you have to be careful with asking about military status. Generally, you can't really ask. It should be volunteered to you because if you do ask and you decide not to rent to that tenant, you could be running afoul of protected class discrimination. You can't discriminate on the basis of military status. So even if you decide not to rent to them for something totally unrelated to the fact that they're in the military, it still might have the color of discrimination. So maybe don't ask until you need to. And as a corollary, because I saw this happen a few times over the years with junior sailors, they thought that their employer or that their landlord would basically not treat them any worse than a civilian. They thought they were going to be treated a little bit better. You know, military, they thought there'd be some kind of, you know, common respect. No, it was basically a liability for the employer to even hire the reservists because the employer didn't know when this person's going to be deployed. And even though there's protections under USERA, which is not part of the SCRA, that's a different presentation that I've done before, you don't necessarily need to divulge your military status. Now, it's probably easy for most people to tell that I either was or maybe am still in the military by the, my you know, ridiculous necks haircut, but I don't need to tell them that. I can wait until it becomes necessary after I've already secured the employment, after I've already secured the tenancy, I mean, even after I've already secured the marriage, but never mind. But the point is, don't prejudice yourself if you think it might be working against you. And sometimes it does. I hate to say that. It's terrible how you know businesses profess to have their support for the military. And then they realize, oh man, having this reservist who's going to be gone at least one week in a month, at least a couple of weeks every year. And who knows, they could be gone for six, 12 months at any time. And I have all these burdens that I have to comply with. Otherwise I could face penalties. You know, maybe it's easier to just not rent to the military or not hire the military. So I hope that isn't the takeaway. I hope you balance the positives of hiring military, the discipline, the reliability, the adherence to deadlines, to objectives. There are far, far more benefits that I'm sure you're aware of when it comes to renting or hiring to military than any potential pitfalls. So as you can probably see in this attached screenshot, if you use the DMDC SCRA verification site, it will show you critical information like the active duty start date, the active duty end date, among other categories of information. Now, why are these two dates important? Because many protections under the SCRA are date specific. In other words, you need to see the date the military orders begin to determine when a tenancy per se can be validly terminated. And you need to see when the orders ended to see, let's say, when the right to set aside a default judgment might terminate. Now, I'll show you a table of the specific dates at the end of this presentation, but for now, just understand that if someone comes to you and says, I need to terminate my lease, you need to know what date your, the orders began. And if you don't find it on this using the DMDC website, you can look for the military orders if they're willing to provide that to you. And if they're not, they have to at least give you a letter from their commanding officer, from their CO. So I'll get into the technicalities of how to tender notice of termination, because that's where, as I said at the beginning, a lot of tenants get it wrong and they shoot themselves in the foot. And they also become victims of surreptitiously inserted waivers in their lease agreement that are essentially invalid. So if you need to stand up, get a drink of water, I'm going to take 10 seconds for me to get some water before I go into the next section about the general provisions of the SCRA. All right, so for the purposes of the SCRA, an active duty service member's period of military service begins when he or she enters active military service. So this often means boot camp, hence the friendly drill instructor. And anybody who's been to boot camp knows that, uh, well, just take some solace in the fact that you probably were yelled at far less than I was. So the period of military service ends on the date of release of active military service or upon death during military service. Now for reservists, like I am, the rights and protections under the SRA are applicable to reservists being activated at the time of their activation or mobilization orders. So the coverage begins basically when you get those orders and it says you shall report by, that's the date your orders begin. That's when your coverage essentially begins. 
And there's always you know, minor exceptions, but don't focus on the exceptions before you learn the rule. The coverage ends upon the completion or termination of their activation or mobilization, again, for reservists. So persons attending training prior to entering active duty, such as officer candidates, should not be included under the category of active military service. And as a side note, if any of you here are JAGs or know an active JAG, um, I would really, really like to speak to them. I, I'm enlisted still uh, as a reservist, but I definitely have a desire to join the JAG Corps, and I would love to speak to any current JAG in any branch of the military. If you know anybody, please get in touch with me. At the end, you'll see my contact information. So the SCRA applies to civil, judicial, or administrative proceedings only. That's why it's called the SCRA, the Service Members Civil Relief Act. It does not apply to criminal proceedings, even though there can be criminal penalties for those who violate the SCRA. And that's generally not on the side of the service member. That's on the side of the creditor, the landlord, et cetera. So the SCRA applies to all federal and state courts and administrative agencies within all states, commonwealths, territories, or possessions of the United States and District of Columbia. So military members are expected to understand their rights under the SCRA. And generally, they get their presentation when they first join, probably in boot camp, as it was for me, and then periodically before a deployment. And there might be additional you know, refresher trainings during general military trainings, GMTs. But if you were or are in the military and are watching this now, it's probably been a while since you had an SCRA brief. So military authorities are required to provide service members with written information of the rights and benefits under the SCRA. And generally this is done during initial orientation for active duty members. For reserve members, this is typically done during the pre-mobilization called workups prior to mobilization. So when I was deployed to Djibouti, it wasn't just, I went from being a civilian to being in Africa in one week. You have to go through a period of a pretty intense training and it covers all the things that you'd expect it to include, but as well, it covers a lot of administrative you know, kind of boring presentations that people sit through because they have to. Sometimes it's a good chance they sneak in a nap, but you may not realize what your rights are under the SCRA if you're a service member. So if this presentation turns out to be useful to anybody in a military unit, uh, let me know. I'm happy to work with your local JAG if they're interested to present this presentation, if it can complement what you're already receiving under the traditional legal instructions. So for reserve members, this was done during the workup cycle and military authorities should, but not necessarily shall, provide pertinent SCRA information to the adult dependents of the service members on their rights and protections under the SCRA, since there are significant protections that apply to not just the service members, but their families and their dependents. So for active duty military participants, I hope this presentation will at least refresh what you should have already learned since it might've been a while ago. And for everybody else, this might be the first time you're learning of your rights and responsibilities as a military dependent or landlord or other interested party. Now waivers, this is a tricky one because service members may sometimes wish to waive some of their SCRA benefits and they're allowed to provided they follow some codified requirements to protect those service members from exploitation. But these voluntarily initiated waivers are generally where rare. What's more common is that these waivers will be dishonestly snuck into contracts like a lease agreement. And an unsophisticated junior service member tenant might think, oh, this is offering more protections. This is showing how much they respect our military. This is nice of them to say that. But what they don't realize is that they just waived some of their rights for basically a no-fault termination if they get qualifying military orders. So in order for a waiver to be effective, it must be executed during or after the service member's eligible period of military service, not before. In other words, a boilerplate waiver contained in just your standard lease agreement that your tenant signs before beginning active duty or receiving mobilization orders is probably going to be considered void. Now, in addition, the written agreement has to specify the legal instrument to which the waiver applies to, such as your lease agreement, as well as the full name of the service member concerned. 
such as ETC, Nicholas, Benton, and Colmar. All right. And then since 2004, waivers now must be executed as a separate instrument and must also be in at least 12 point type. So waivers, again, are generally rare, but some that typically do occur are modifications or terminations of the terms of a contract, such as a lease or obligations secured by a mortgage, trust, deed, lien, or other security in the nature of a mortgage. Now, while it should be obvious that no service member can be penalized for exercising their lawful rights under the SCRA, what's less obvious is that the SCRA protects service members from any penalties imposed solely due to their invocation of rights. So, for example, if a service member wants to invoke their SCRA rights, then that service member shall not be subject to any adverse determination letters, denials, revocation, or adverse modifications of their credit or denial of insurance just because they exercised their rights and they sought to lower their interest rate from, say, 18% on their credit card to 6%. And if the lender revokes a credit card, does any of those prohibited actions that I just mentioned, then if it followed a valid request to exercise their SCR rights, such as you know, to cap the interest rate at 6%, that would presumably be prohibited unless the service member fails to comply with other obligations that were unrelated to their invocation of their SCRA rights. Like if they did something completely different, um, they just drew up a huge debt, uh, they're not paying it, um, they're still not paying their credit card bill, even though it's been lowered to 6%. That doesn't mean that that creditor can't then take further actions to protect the creditor as well as affect that debtor's rights. It's just saying that if you say, I want to exercise my SCRA rights and I'm going to continue paying you know, my credit card as I have been doing, but I just want to lower my interest rate to 6%, that in itself is not a sufficient basis for the credit card company to take any steps that would adversely affect you as a debtor. So that's the end of that section. I'm gonna take a sip of water and then we're gonna talk about default judgments and other types of general relief. So I can't ask if anybody knows or doesn't know what a default judgment is. I'm gonna assume that nobody does. So a default judgment in the plaintiff's favor may occur when a defendant fails to appear and contest the case against them. So why do you think active service members might need greater protection from default judgments than ordinary civilians? Well, in case it wasn't clear when I spoke about this concept earlier, it's going to affect service members disproportionately if they are out of state, out of country, even off of the land mass and they're out in the water or in a submarine. I mean, how much worse could you make it for someone and how easy could it be for an unscrupulous plaintiff to exploit that vulnerability? So that's why the government steps in. Essentially, service members are in a loose way clients of the government. They're serving their government in a military capacity. So it's the least the government can do to at least offset some of the immense harms that service members have to endure for themselves and their families. So why do you, uh, why would custody proceedings be included under this? Well, because you could have a hearing and one of the examples of this was in uh, the marriage of Lopez. And I have the citation on that one. And now in that case, the third district court of appeals held that it was an abuse of discretion to deny the service member's husband's later motion to revoke the spousal support modification that was filed by his ex-wife because he'd been on active military duty, not in California, not in the United States, but in Germany at the time. And the trial court did not appoint an attorney to represent the husband. So that was judicial error. And that's why the third district court of appeals struck down the trial court's decision. So when you are proceeding as a litigant and when you have a client who is potentially in the military, it doesn't matter if you know if they are or not. If there's a defendant, it doesn't matter if you know if they're in the military or not. You have to still do your due diligence. You have to generally provide an affidavit. Uh, written is generally preferred, but in some cases it can just be a sworn statement. If you have experience in small claims, what you see a lot is 
if you spend all the time in small claims, I'm not going to tell you why I do, but let's just say I do. So in small claims, if you are seeking a default judgment because the defendant didn't appear, then what happens next is a prove up hearing. And you need to basically do an abbreviated litigation. It's already an abbreviated trial when it's in small claims. It's even more of a cursory trial when it's a prove up hearing. You just basically need to show the pro tem judge or the commissioner, here's the basis for my suit. Here's how I quantified and substantiated my damages. And no, the defendant is not in the military. I either proved that they weren't because I did my due diligence or I didn't and I don't know. And that's always better to say, I don't know, because then it takes the burden off of you. The worst thing that you can do is lie and say the defendant is not in the military when you know they are or when you didn't even check because you're basically swearing under perjury that you know the answer to. So it's always safer to say, I don't know if you truly don't know, because if you lie, then at best, they're going to overturn the judgment. At worst, you're going to face penalties. So with default judgments, what can get tricky is that you have to be able to notify the court of your inability to appear, but you don't want it to be a general appearance and therefore potentially waive your SCRA protections. So this is why if you are watching this and you're a service member and you're unrepresented by counsel, then I urge you to candidly speak to your legal services office before you communicate anything with the opposing counsel or with the court. So next, the statute of limitations. So in, in cases where statute of limitations would prohibit any court action with respect to a lawsuit, after expiration of the time specified by law, in other words, you have to use it or lose it. You have to bring your suit or you're prohibited because you waited too long. Then what this section, section 3936, as you can see, as I promised you earlier, if you look down on the bottom right on your screen, you'll see which section of the US code I'm citing as well as the official title of that section. This is under section 3936 of title 50 of the US code entitled statute of limitations. So this is talking about if, you are in the military, then you're not going to necessarily have to use it or lose it during that time of eligible military service. In other words, the SCRA extends, it's called tolling the time period applicable to a covered service member by an amount of time equal to the person's period of military service. Now, one of the favorites, the interest cap. Now, another question for you to ponder since I can't call on anybody during this presentation. Can anyone posit why it might be necessary to cap interest rates for service members' debts that they incurred prior to, but not during active military service? Well, one of the most prized protections under the SCRA is the federally mandated interest rate cap of 6% on any debt incurred by a service member before entering active service, provided the service member's ability to pay is materially affected by military service. Now, this is what it says in the law that you don't automatically get it, but it's such a low standard that if you apply for it, it's very, it's almost impossible for you to find a creditor who's not just going to say, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll lower your interest rate. They know the risks of really going back and forth and saying, well, is your ability to pay really materially affected? You know, let's look at this. Maybe we'll do a, you know, they're, they're not going to, take their time if they're you know, a multi-state lending corporation to just focus on you, unless you've given them reason to in the past. So it's pretty loosely worded, even though it's strict in the code. And this protection applies to debts that were incurred by service members individually or jointly with their spouses. So the 6% cap had been useful for many years for high interest credit card balances, but more recently, this cap has once again become useful for mortgage rates. Now that the average interest rate that I checked yesterday for a 30 year fixed is again, above 7%. And this presentation, if you're watching this later next year, this is December, 2023. So as for student loans, this one is trickier. As of August 14th, 2008, federally guaranteed student loans dispersed after this date are now treated like all other debts incurred prior to entering active duty. So furthermore, service members currently on active duty who received loans prior to, to entering active duty will be able to claim the 6% cap. 
But if a creditor can demonstrate that the debtor military service does not materially affect the debtor service member's ability to absorb an interest rate greater than 6%, then the creditor can petition the court for relief under section 3937 just going to be rare and it's not going to look well publicly with their PR and their public image. So wrapping up pretty, pretty soon, I uh, hope you like my graphic here, uh, using AI to build some of these images. So when can notice to terminate be given? So under federal and California state law, a service member will generally be permitted to give notice to terminate a real property lease early, provided that one of the following occurs for the service member during the term of the lease. So one, the service member entered into active military service during the lease agreement and received official military orders with a report date clearly indicated. Two, received orders to deploy for at least 90 days. Three, received permanent change of station orders. When I say PCS, I'm talking about permanent change of station orders. Four, has been called to active duty as a member of the National Guard or Reserves, or five, has been ordered into military housing. So in other words, almost any military requirement that takes a service member away from the current location for 90 days or more is presumably a valid reason for a service member to invoke the SCRA to break his or her lease. Now, the decision to, determinate, to terminate a lease for military service is optional, of course, it's optional for the service member, and it's a decision that only the service member or the service member's spouse can make if they are married co-tenants. So in addition to Section 3955 of Title 50 of the U.S. Code, also look under California Military and Veterans Code, Section 409. So the SCRA prohibits a landlord from evicting a service member or the service member's family from a residence during a period of military service without a court order. Again, if you're in California, this isn't much different from how evictions work in California. No self-help, has to go through an unlawful detainer, have to get a favorable judgment, the writ of possession. You will not do a lockout. The only person that is authorized to basically throw someone's stuff out, the only time someone should be putting their hands on someone else's property, personal property, is the sheriff. That's They get to do it, not you. No matter how good your excuse is, don't do it. You're going to get yourself in far worse trouble than you already think your tenant is in. So the law, as originally passed by Congress, applied to dwellings with monthly rents of $2,400 or less. And again, when I say the law, I'm talking, in case you can't see the screen, I hope you can, and let us know if you can't. I'm talking about the annual rent threshold to where your tenancy is covered under SCRA for non-judicial evictions. If your monthly rent is at or below this quite exorbitant amount of $9,106.46 for this year, then your rent is presumably protected under the SCRA. So when the law was first passed, this number was $2,400. Now, because of inflation, it's $9,106.46. Now, in Inflation has slowed in its growth. You know, you hear in the news that inflation is down to 3%. That doesn't mean it's deflation. That just means the rate of prices going up is slowing. I think people misunderstand that a lot. They're never talking about deflation. It's just the rate of prices getting higher is slowing. I guess that's good news, but not. All right, so although inflation has slowed in its growth, we're still experiencing enough national inflation to presume that the figures for next year, 2024, might be revised even higher, albeit with less of a jump than during the recent years. Now, this bar to non-judicial self-help evictions is less important for California. So that's why I'm gonna skip over some more discussion of it because you already have some good protections in California, regardless of whether you're a service member or not. But there's some other protections that you will enjoy as a service member tenant under the SCRA for things like security deposits, which we'll talk about in a moment. So what types of leases are included under the SCRA? So there's a misunderstanding that a lot of people have that it just applies to your primary residential tenancy. It applies to all kinds of tenancies that are leased and occupied by the service member or intended to be occupied by the service member or the service member's dependents. This includes leases of premises for residential use, professional use, business, agricultural, and similar purposes. 
So they have to be executed prior to military service or executed during active duty when the service member subsequently receives military orders for a permanent change of station for a period of not less than 90 days. Now, I'm going to have to start skipping over some of the things I wanted to say to get to some of the slides that I absolutely don't want to skip over. Um, there's just not enough time. So what is a military clause and why might both a landlord and a tenant who is already in the military or contemplating joining the military want to insist on including a military clause in their lease? Well, whether you're a landlord or a tenant, one reason to insist on a military clause, which benefits both sides, is that it minimizes the chances for mutual misunderstandings from ambiguities as to how a service member is to deliver a notice in the event that the service member invokes his or her SCRA rights to terminate a lease under the SCRA. So an example of language in a military clause might be, in, in, you can see on the screen, in the event the tenant is, or here if it becomes a member of the United States Armed Forces, then you know, they will terminate this lease upon giving 30 days written notice to the landlord. The tenant shall also provide the landlord a copy of the official orders or a letter signed by the tenant's commanding officer. So this is fine to say. Just be careful if you're signing this as a tenant and you already know you're in the military or the reserves, uh, because even if this is one of the areas of the SCRA that still can protect you if you're already in the military, you need to be mindful that you're not giving up any of your rights. So just like states can only add to federal rules that offer protections to you, in other words, they can only add to your federal rights. They can't take away. Your landlord can only add to your federally codified SCRA rights. The landlord can never curtail your rights. If you're unsure, it's always worth it to talk to a lawyer. And if you have access to a military attorney, a JAG, a real so, you know, staff judge advocate, uh, that's the best. But if you're a reservist, you might you know, have some problems with that. And one of the reasons why I'm doing this presentation is because of a reservist friend that I helped. And he and the landlord were both confused by what their obligations and rights were. So if they had a military clause similar to this, and it was fairly worded, it could have avoided all of the headache and the threats of litigation. Now, here's an example of information that you'll find on the internet that's just bad. The problem with the internet is that you will always find an answer. You just won't always find the correct answer. So in this and I don't want to name the website, even though it's on the screen, they're saying, and they emphasize it, contrary to popular belief, the Soldiers and Sailors Civil Relief Act does not help you break a lease when receiving transfer orders. Now, hopefully this is just old information because it's referring to the SSCRA, not the SCRA, but does anybody understand why this is not accurate? Because you can break a lease when receiving transfer orders. Transfer orders are essentially known as PCS orders. And why would you not be able to break your lease if you are moving against your will to someplace that the government says you shall move to? So that's just bad information. That's why you want to, and unfortunately that was you know, a, a dot mill website. So you have to be careful. Talk to an attorney, talk to an attorney that knows what they're talking about. So eligible termination of a lease under the SCRA is effective by delivery of written notice of the lessee's termination and a copy of the service under military orders to the landlord or landlord's agent. And there's specific formats that it has to be delivered under. This is one of the things that you want to have worked out in your lease agreement uh, if there's a military clause in there. And then you'd want to send a letter that complies with your obligations under the SCRA to your landlord. And then the effective date of termination, this is another kind of tricky one. Generally, most leases are not prepaid. Most, most leases have rent due that's due on the first or the fifth, usually the first. And if the lease provides for monthly payment of rent, then the termination of the lease is effective 30 days after the first date on which the next rental payment is due after the date on which the notice is delivered. Okay, it's worded as complex and confusing as they could, so let me make it clear. Let's say your rent is due on the first of each month. If you were to give your notice any day after the first, say August 10th, then your next rental due date would be when? September 1st. And since the lease would terminate 30 days after that, that means the latest your lease would terminate, assuming you give proper notice, would be October 1st. 30 days past September, April, June, and November, right? So that's because September only has 30 days. 
And then I'm not going to talk about the other types of leases because that's rare for people that are watching this. You're not generally prepaying your leases. If it's commercial, then maybe you are. But most of the time, it's residential tenancies that you're paying monthly. So just come away with that before I confuse you with the exceptions. Now, because I'm a landlord-tenant attorney specializing in California, landlord-tenant law, I urge both landlords and tenants to perform a pre-move-out inspection two weeks prior to the new move-out date, which might be six, eight, 10 months before you know the original end of the lease. If you are going to give your SRA notice and it's going to end in 30 days, then two weeks before that, you should do the initial inspection. It's the second of the three inspections. It's two weeks before you move out. So the landlord goes room to room with you. Usually it's the same sheet that when you first moved in, you marked all the pre-existing damage. Now you're marking all the Dam the landlord is now marking all the damage that arose during your tenancy and giving you a chance within two weeks to ameliorate those damages, which are which the damages that you're allowed to fix. You're not allowed to do you know work that you're not qualified to do, but you're allowed to hire professionals. You're allowed to get it done. You just get a heads up notice of here's everything that's going to be deducted from the security deposit. If I don't get it fixed by the time I move out, because after you're gone, then the landlord basically has free reign. But it's up to the landlord to notify the tenant of their right to request or reject the initial inspection. Most landlords get it wrong and they think it's up to the tenant to request it, it's not. So security deposits, you cannot use the tenant's security deposit to cover for the breach if they're moving out early because the SCRA is expressly prohibited to use their security deposit to cover for any of the remaining months. You have to mitigate damages at your own expense and the landlord can still withhold damages beyond ordinary wear and tear, just make sure if you're a landlord, you're quantifying your damages, you're keeping the receipts. And then one more thing about security deposits in California, and I'm trying to fight the urge to sneeze. Under existing California law since 2019, active members were already protected by a cap on their security deposits to one month's rent for unfurnished units and two months rent for furnished units. But beginning July 1st of 2024, again, July 1st of next year, not January 1st, a new law will take effect. It's called AB 12. It's going to limit rent in most cases to one month's rent for all tenants. Now the exceptions to AB 12 are for small landlords, which is defined in the statute. And that is where it gets a little tricky, but it won't apply to active duty members. Therefore, no members who already meet California's definition of active duty under California Military Veterans Code shall be charged more than one month's rent as a security deposit. So there's more details on AB 12 that you should read if you're curious. The point of this presentation is on the SCRA, not AB 12. So unless a court orders otherwise, a landlord or a person with paramount title cannot evict a service member through non-judicial evictions. And I'm gonna have to skip over some details on this. We already touched on it. I'm gonna talk about automobile leases. Um, so service members are protected when they breach certain types of contracts under certain conditions. Why might that be? Because if you are being deployed to Djibouti or someplace where you're not gonna bring your car on the, you know, the C-17, uh, you have no use for it. Now you could just keep making payments. This is only for lease payments. This isn't for financing. So you are you shouldn't be expected to bear the burden of the contract with none of the benefits. That's why the SCRA allows you to terminate your auto lease without penalty. You just need to provide written notice of the termination, copy your military orders, if you can get those, otherwise the SEALs letter, deliver the written notice by hand, by private carrier, by certified mail with a return receipt from the US Post Office, or electronic means such as email or communications portal designed by the lender or agent, and then return the vehicle within 15 days after the date of delivery of the written notice of termination. And then at that point, your auto lease will be terminated. So the lessor cannot charge you for any early cancellations, but they still can charge you for any unpaid taxes or title registration fees, summons, or outstanding fees, including reasonable charges for excessive wear and tear and mileage that were due and unpaid on the date of your termination. And if you made any advance payments, then you have to be refunded those payments within 30 days of the termination. And if you feel that your rights were violated under this section, 3952, definitely speak to a JAG attorney. If they can't resolve it, then they can escalate it to the US Department of Justice. You can also cancel any type of these consumer contracts that you see on the screen. You can reserve your phone number. Um, if you're going to be gone for three years or less, you just have to act when you get back promptly. And I'm really trying to finish up this quickly. Uh, there's a new law that recently took effect, and this is really important. 
This actually took effect this year in 2023. And this was pursuant to the Veterans Auto and Education Improvement Act of 2022. This is called the portability of professional licenses of service members and their spouses. And this is based on the fact that there was a survey that said 48% of, 48 of the active duty spouse respondents say that finding employment was one of the most critical problems that these spouses experienced during PCS moves. And it's because their licenses just weren't recognized from one jurisdiction to the next. So the five requirements to take advantage of the new professional license portability law are that you relocated outside of the jurisdiction of the licensing authority, you provided the military orders to the licensing authority of the new jurisdiction, you've actively used your license or certificate during the two years immediately preceding the move, you're in good standing with A, the licensing authority that issued the covered license, and B, every other licensing authority that issued a license or certificate valid for a similar scope of practice and in the discipline applied for in the new jurisdiction. Finally, five, you submit to the authority of the licensing authority in the new jurisdiction for the purposes of standards of practice, discipline, and fulfillment of any continuing education requirements, which is why you're here if you're an attorney watching this because you're getting one hour of CLE credit. So if the five criteria are met, then the service member or their spouse's covered license or certificate shall be considered valid at a similar scope of practice and in the discipline applied for in the new jurisdiction for the duration of military orders. Now, you probably have one question if you're an attorney, especially if you or your spouse are attorneys and one of them is in the military, does this apply to the practice of law? And the answer is no, that's the only exception. You cannot use this to get around California's onerous bar requirements. You are not subject to the SCRA for that protection. But in conclusion, just made it a little bit late. Um, we talked about the SRA. Why is it necessary? What its background was? What kind of protections you have for judgments, to set aside a judgment, to stay civil actions? We talked about what your obligations are as a landlord, as a creditor, if you want to enact a lien, if you want to do a, a default judgment. Hopefully you learned more than you already knew about this topic. And if you knew nothing about it, then I think that was a slam dunk for me. But if you are in the lending or leasing business, and after you're watching this, maybe wondering if it's just too much liability, as I talked about at the beginning to you know rent or offer services to military tenants, I urge you to rethink that the military, in my opinion, from what I've seen, and I don't get paid to say this, I'm not a recruiter, it's just, it was the most life-changing experience. Just boot camp alone, I benefited more from than I think law school and college combined. And I wasn't someone who had problems with drugs. I never had any problems with the law, I still haven't. It is just something that has absolutely helped me in every other aspect of my life. Everybody needs discipline to accomplish anything of importance. And if you have kids, consider the military. It's always been an option for school to be free, basically since the 40s. It's been a way for them to mature, not at your own expense by sending them to college, but it's something that I hope the people that are watching this, and by the way, thank you for your time and attention, will not just be discouraged from renting to the military because of the potential risks of running afoul of the SCRA. It's not as onerous as it seems. Knowledge can only help and learn more about this. I showed you the links. The presentation will be made available through the Law Library website since I spoke pretty quickly. And then the last little bonus I'll give you, if I can call it that, is this I think is going to help you sort out what your different obligations are at the different timeframes. 30, 60 days, 90 days, 180 days, 365 days. Uh, I, I have a little typo there. I repeated 180 days, ignore that. but that is everything that I found in the US code for the SCRA based on certain days of eligibility. I'll make a quick tweak to that after this, so we'll put up the correct slides. Uh, but I hope you found this helpful. Here's an index of all the slides we discussed. And if you wanna get in touch with me, here's the QR code. You can hold up your phone to the screen or the printed handout. And I can't promise that I'll answer Every legal question, I will generally refer you to the JAG if you're in the military. I also will be able to help you with landlord-tenant if that is what you need. But this presentation obviously was for informational purposes only. 
not legal advice specific to your legal case because every case is different and every fact pattern is different. I hope you found this helpful. Thank you for your time. Thank you everybody for joining us and thanks, Nick. Uh, I just want to let you know we had an attendee, Dan, who said thank you for the encouraging and informative presentation. Oh, that's nice. I appreciate that, Dan. Thank All you, right. Nick. All right, thank you.